All right, well, I'm going to get kicked off here. Um, so my name is Chris Reed. Uh, I am the Director of Product Cybersecurity at Eli Lilly. Um, I'll explain that a little bit. I used, to, I used to hate it when people put cyber on security. So I, have to, I always have to preface it when I'm in an audience like this. Um, because our main products are obviously pharmaceuticals. And so when we talk about product security within our company, it's usually about anti-counterfeiting um, and other technology like that. So I've had to put cybersecurity on things when I put product with it because uh, otherwise people think I'm talking about anti-counterfeiting and that's not what I do. Um, but Lily is actually getting into um, software security products. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. Uh, I can't share specific information about what we're doing at Lily, but I'll kind of walk some parallels to kind of give you a vision of, of what that looks like today. Um, I've been at Lilly for 19 years, um, been in security for 15 of those, and um, I've had a, a number of roles um, doing security architecture. I've managed our operations team. Um, I have uh, led pen testing engagements. Like I don't, I'm not. I would never claim to be a pen tester myself. I, um, but I know what good ones look like, and I like to engage them and give them fun projects to do in our environment. Um, I've, I help write some of our policies and standards. Um, so I've had, a, in 15 years, I've had a whole bunch of jobs um, and roles. And one of the fun things that I get to do as well is um, I'm one of our, we, we have a handful, maybe five or six um, third party auditors. And I'm actually certified within our company where I can go lead audits of third parties. and. What's nice about that is even though a lot of, a lot of times it's our quality units that do that, but um, I was trained up to do it because I get sent to the fun ones. Um, I can actually make the claim. Um, I'm one of the few people as a customer that got to go on site at AWS before they stopped letting customers go. Um, we've done Microsoft and Salesforce and um, Box.com, like and the list goes on. And what I love about that is I actually get to go see what their practices look like which then helps inform you know, what we should be doing, because uh, I can't say that we're always bleeding edge like some of these companies are. So it's kind of fun to just see what other people are doing. Um, so I get a pretty good e experience to, to know what's happening out there. Um, and really, as I kind of mentioned, my job's right now to establish our security program around products. Um, and when I say products, I mean software that we're somehow going to monetize. Um, we have websites and marketing stuff all over the place, um, but we actually have um, what I can share publicly if you ever want to go look it up. Um, there was a Wall Street Journal article back in late November um, where we're actually working on a um, what we call closed loop insulin pump that will automatically read off a person's body their blood glucose and make changes in the amount of insulin being injected in in close to real time. I won't say real time, but pretty close. Um, you know, we think that that can really change the way um, the care of diabetes and things like that happen, you know, is, is done in our world. So we have a lot of fun projects underway. Um, so speaking of that, so digital healthcare, I'm gonna give this context here. Um, I call it the final frontier because somehow we have self-driving cars, but we still have really awful medical technology. And I don't mean to slam anyone if anyone's in that field, um, but if you go into a hospital and look at everything under the desks that are running all the equipment that, that's in the room, sometimes I get worried, and we should be, right? Um, and really, if you think about the opportunity here, it's huge. We have a, a cost problem, and we have a standard of care problem. Um, if you really think about healthcare, the amount of data points the medical system gets on like our condition is actually pretty small. Like we'll go and do a lab work. I mean, I, I think myself, I've done lab work like usually about once a year, even though I'm getting older. <laughs> um, that's not a very frequent sampling period, right? Um, and if you really think about the way we do healthcare, it's not very, even though it should be data driven, it's not very data driven. Um, I threw this up here just to give an example that if you think about Parkinson's, um, my uncle has Parkinson's, and so unfortunately I get to live this. And um, one thing that's interesting about Parkinson's, Parkinson's is that they can have good days and they can have bad days. 
There's nights that he doesn't get any sleep and he's just an absolute mess and really doesn't want to leave the house. There's other days that he goes out and he's almost perfectly normal. And um, so if you marry that with what I just explained about how care is infrequent, um, imagine if he goes to the doctor always on a good day and the doctor's like, he's not that bad, I'm not going to change his medication. But really he's suffering at the, in between the times that he actually goes and makes those visits. So really, the amount of data we're basing some of those decisions on. So what you kind of see drawn up here is, um, you know, with Parkinson's, a lot of it's about muscle movement. So imagine our, our watches that are measuring all those movements. Um, that, that type of data can be used to feed algorithms. And what it's showing here is a closed loop down to where the, it's dispensing possibly different levels of medication for that person to take to help more real time, I, again, I keep abusing the word real time, but you all know what I'm saying. Um, at least we're reducing the window now of, of trying to, 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 to bring the care a little closer to actually meeting the, the patient need. What's The other thing that's interesting about this is if you think about the way, even the what reason Lily's interested in this, um, you know, medicine today, we pay by volume. Like, I bought five pills, I paid for five pills. Um, we're working, the industry is trying to get to more performance-based payment. Like, if someone's blood glucose stays in range, we get paid. If it doesn't stay in range, we don't get paid. Um, and that way we can try to reduce waste and cost in the system, because there's probably lots of medicine being taken that's actually not having the result that people um, intend it to have. So there's, if you think about, as we can instrument healthcare with data, the amount of improvement we can drive into the system and cost we can reduce out of it. It's pretty f amazing to think about. Um, and lots of companies are working on this, um, but it is a tough industry to break into right now. Um, I have a hypothetical app, again, that I wanted to, or a situation, just to kind of drive this point home, and then I'll use it to talk, bring into the rest of the talk. Um, so my wife, as a personal example, um, my wife with all my kids, one of them sitting up here, <laughs> um, <laughs> he, uh, she had pretty complicated pregnancies. Um, on all of them, she had preeclampsia, so high blood pressure, dangerously high blood pressure, to the point where for the last eight weeks or, or more, she was on complete bed rest because she needed to try to keep her blood pressure down. Um, on our, on our, our third pregnancy, um, she had gestational diabetes. And so, um, and it was a stressful time in general. We actually had had quite a few complications in pregnancy. So, um, you know, moms are already stressed out from all this going on, but if they've had traumatic experiences, all this just adds to the experience. And so it can be pretty stressful. And her treatment, this was interesting, her treatment was four or five days, she would um, prick her finger, onto a strip, put it into a meter, record the glucose and with a pen and paper, um, and do a log. Um, she would also use a heart rate monitor, or a blood pressure cuff three or four times a day to kind of watch her blood pressure. Um, and then every day she had to call the doctor's office and relay all those values. And then the doctor would make decisions on, have I given you enough medication or do I need to change anything? Um, in addition to that, because they're worried about the high blood pressure, she had to go in three times a week to a doctor's office so they could strap a fetal heart rate monitor to her to see if the baby was under distress. Um, and once a week, she had to go into OBGYN's office. So let's add all that up. <laughs> Does that feel like a good experience for a patient? Um, and think about the cost of that. We have a facility that she's going to that has you know, billing and and someone to actually strap the heart rate monitor on and then they walk out and every once in a while they come in, yep, it looks good. Um, it's not complicated but what they were doing, um, but we have lots of people involved and lots of waste. And so um, I've given a version of this talk before and I, I, I kind of joke that we had this app that we could call Gestation. Um, so imagine if you had an app on your phone that could read your heart rate and I'm exaggerating a little bit, although not totally, because they are blood pressure ones, and I know, I believe, companies like Apple are working on blood pressure here. They already get your heart rate. Um, so imagine that data feed into your phone. Um, it's not too far-fetched to also think about glucose monitors, as you've heard me talk about, um, or even 
Um, also, the fetal heart rate that you could wear a device on the belly that would actually be picking up the heart, heart rate of the baby. And all that could be collected in, let's say, five-minute increments. So instead of going to the doctor's office three times a week to make sure your baby's all right, you're now getting data throughout the day um, and can react quicker if there really is an issue. Um, which, given the fact that if there really was an issue, like if I had to wait two days to go back in for my test, like that's a long time for a baby to be in distress inside the womb. And so um, you could also track your medication that you're taking in there. Um, you could integrate so that you're giving information to the patient on ways to treat themselves. And the best part about this is all this could integrate back to the electronic healthcare record system at the hospital. So the doctor could actually, when you come back in for your once a week visit now, instead of coming in four times a week, they could actually see all the data in front of them. And you could even set up where they have alarms so that if you're getting out of range, they're getting notified right away to call you and take action and try to make sure your care is being handled. That seems like a better patient experience. Um, believe it or not, it might actually reduce costs because you don't have all these extra people involved. Um, so that's the hypothetical situation. Um, this is a really awful architecture picture. <laughs> But just to give you an idea, um, both of the devices, the, the fetal heart rate monitor and the other one here exist today. So we're not talking about technology that doesn't exist. You can have an app on a phone, the watch. Um, all this data could be fed up to, of course, the cloud because everything's in the cloud. Um, that could integrate back to the EHR at the hospital network. And then this could, you could have um, an integration with the EHR for the doctor to see as they come into the room. So the one thing I would emphasize in this type of care is obviously privacy and security are important. We all would recognize that. Um, but the other thing that gets interesting in this context, just like self-driving cars, is safety is important. This is probably a, per a little bit lower safety situation. But if our software system messes up here, we could actually impact the health of a baby or a patient. Um, we could. There's a number of things, especially when I talked earlier about closed-looped um, glucose or insulin pumps. If we over-inject, someone literally can die from that. Um, so you could get into some pretty serious situations, and so that becomes a big factor of this. So let's just say that in this scenario, we take the quality of the software very seriously, and we're, we're regulated heavily because of that. Um, we're expected to meet a pretty high bar and be able to prove that we're doing all the work to make sure the security, the privacy, and the safety of the system is what we claim it to be. And so this is where I get to make fun of, this is where I feel like I've lived the hamster wheel. Because this is, you probably all have seen this, this is the agile development method, which is really just waterfall. It just kind of goes <laughs> infinitely. Um, to be fair, this drawing probably in the code part is going on sprints. Um, if it's at truly agile. But that's not important. What's, what's important here is the way we typically have handled security is, you know, back in the planning phase, we're doing some type of risk assessment on the project to understand what's changing and how much all the steps that we need to add. You know, that probably takes about a week to get all the information we need, right? And of course, they're inventorying all their open source because everyone does that. That takes three days. Um, and then, of course, they're doing static scans on all their code to try to make sure they're catching all the cross-site scripting and all the, the mistakes they commonly make. Three days, I'm just, I'm putting days on here and to be honest with you, those are pretty generous periods of time of if something got ran or a report got generated, someone had to respond to it, that's pretty generous that it would only take three days. Um, we're gonna do some dynamic scanning. Uh, we're gonna hire a team to pen test it when we're getting ready and you know somewhere in our testing phase. Pen test takes a week to test it a week to write the report and respond to all the results. Um, of course, in production, we're going to make sure all of our software is supported. For all those IT folks in the room, um, who, um, have you ever, I'm, I'm trying not to have you come clean about your own organization, um, is anyone running an unsupported version of Windows in your environment? <laughs> we are, for sure. Not in our medical devices, just to be clear. Um, but in these old systems, even doing something as basic as staying on a supported version of an operating system has been difficult. And that's true. Um, you can see that um, uh, last summer in the, the WannaCry 
um, ransomware outbreak, right? There's a lot of devices in hospital networks and things like that that are so far out of date because the medical device or whatever can't support upgrading the operating system. Of course, we got patching, and of course, we're going to patch all of our open source too because we've done a good job inventorying it. I'm being funny there because, you know, I will tell you developers are notorious for not knowing all the open source embedded in their products. Um, they might know the first level, but they don't understand that when they brought that in, it brought five other libraries down below it. Um, so we can be pretty bad. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So when you add all that up, just my generous values here, that's about 10 weeks of security work through the cycle. Um, does that feel like something our product teams are going to tolerate in terms of adding to the timeline, possibly delay? Uh, and that's if everything goes well. That, mean, that means you didn't find something to deal with. Um, and then what's interesting, too, about this is it tends to be pretty poor handoff. Like development teams, they want to work quick. They want to find things. They want to fix them. Um, when I find a problem here in pen testing and make them go back to coding, they're not very happy with us. Um, you know, pen testing should really be a verification, not our discovery of the flaws that we've had. Um, and so, of course, we have this, all this documentation to prove that we know what we're doing. This is honestly just what makes me kind of crazy. Um, and then you add on top of that, and this is where the hamster wheel analogy does come in. Um, you have this concept now of DevOps. How many of you feel like you understand DevOps pretty well? A couple of you. Uh, let me talk about it a little bit. So. Imagine your traditional IT system that I've almost just walked through. Um, DevOps takes that and s makes it much faster because what they're doing is they're, they're now automating a lot of the work that used to be done. So, um, and I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to build onto this. So this. It'll be worth taking a moment to do. Uh, so imagine they're keeping all their source code in GitHub. Every time they do a pull request, emerge that back in to the, the master branch of code. A system like Jenkins, a continuous integration system, will, will detect that that's happened and immediately start work to build new containers that will host the app. It'll build new um, unit tests. It'll actually spin up environments to run the unit tests and make sure everything passed. Um, it'll then check the new, if it passes all of its tests, it'll check that new container into a repository. And then usually you have multiple branches happening uh, multiple components to the system. So then it'll also kick off work to build the entire environment and then run integration testing. All this gets automated. And it's really cool to watch. Um, but it's terrifying as a security person because they're now, <laughs> they're now working often at best, in, in my case, at best in weeks, if not in days, and sometimes faster. If you, I don't, I can't quote like Netflix and folks. Um, specifically, but if you ever heard the stories about Netflix, it's not unusual to hear that they are, they are turning around code, like they're pushing somewhere on the order of hundreds of times a day code out to their production environment. Like they make small changes fast. So literally hours is what their cycle's measured in, and this is what DevOps is doing to the development life cycle. And so, again, this is where, uh, this is my favorite one out of that video because this is how I feel like, where he just goes and then he just loses it. <laughs> and then my best, the, my favorite part here is the expression after he falls out, just kind of shaking. <laughs> when I see our team starting to move this fast, I get nervous, because I get nervous about having enough time to find all the major things that they've just worked into their system. Um, it's, and, and so to be honest with you, I kind of, for a while, I felt like I needed to find a new job, as it says up there. I just felt like, how am I ever going to keep up with this? This is really cool what they're doing, but how am I going to meet this demand? And that's when I finally realized, if I can't beat them, i got to join them. And uh, I'm really lucky because I do have some, I'm a computer science grad, so I, I'm, I would never again, like I'm not a pen, test, pen tester, I'm not a developer, but I can code. Um, and I apologize in advance for the next slide. I'm going to stay on it for a little bit. This is where I didn't get enough time to really work the story out, but it's going to get worked a little better. Um, it's really busy, but I'm going to walk you through it. 
this is where I realized that we needed, the security team needed to start acting like the development team. Um, so let me walk through this. I've talked through this a little bit already, um, but I'm gonna keep building on this. Um, so what you've got up in the top left is a branch structure from a development project. So you'll see the top one, the yellow box says master. Master typically is the code that you're running in production. Um, then you have the next level up is what we would call release candidate. Um, you typically reserve a level there because you never know when you might have to fix a bug in production while you're doing development. So there's a release branch that you have. And then there's a branch that's called development where you have an active, your next release is being actively developed and worked. And then the developers check out features, like when they get a, assigned a, a, a requirement or a user story, they're working on those features. And basically as they work, they're committing that code back and it's going back into the branch above. And this is happening constantly through the project. So in a specific week or two time frame, you've got, let's say, 10 or 12 features that have been checked out of that branch, have been worked on and then merged or pulled back into the development branch. And so what we need to do so that we don't wait till the end of the project, so this is the next line that I'm gonna talk through. And I know the text is a little small. You don't have to worry about seeing it. You'll get the idea here. Um, how do we integrate security as far into the coding process as we can so that we're catching things and fixing their issues? So a tool like Jenkins can automatically detect when things have come back in the, the develop branch and it can initiate the process, as I mentioned earlier, to start automatically in the background running all the required stuff to approve that code and make sure it's ready to go. So what you kind of see happening here is first what it does is it builds um, a container that it's going to use to do its testing with. It then splits into three paths where it runs, a, as my example up here, I said it was going to run a tool called Sonar.js because it's a JavaScript app in this example. Um, so it's going to do some static analysis. Um, it's going to run a tool called NSP, which is an open source tool to look at all the open source libraries to make sure there aren't security vulnerabilities that have been introduced. It's also going to build a test image. It's going to then, on the next step, start to run unit testing. And the whole, and then the security test hit a decision point. We can tune this and we can say, for instance, if I see any critical or high vulnerabilities, we will do what we call break the build. We'll say your build failed, go back to the drawing board. So what's nice about this is the developer just checked this in and, and pulled it up into the develop branch. In probably five or 10 minutes, they're gonna get a notification. We use Slack a lot, but there's other ways they can see this. They're gonna get, get a notification that says, oh, sorry, your build failed. And it's gonna have all the details of why it failed and that they've gotta go back and fix those issues. So it could have failed because they introduced um, an open source library that had a vulnerability. So they might have to go back and make sure they have the right version of that or just realize that it's vulnerable and they have to figure out some other way to solve that problem. Um, if they introduced a, um, a cross-site scripting error, it'll tell them that. They can go back and, and work those issues. And the whole point is they'll go back and work that. They'll, they'll do a pull request back and it'll kick off the build process again. So they, they basically are getting pretty real feedback. Their, their test is getting graded in real time and they're getting pretty instant feedback now on whether or not they're, they're cut out to move forward. And then what you see on the right side is where once you've passed what we can do as a unit test, um, it's then building up an environment to do more dynamic testing. So this on the right is where you would run more dynamic scanning, like um, web app scanning um, or other tools. Um, and again, anywhere along the way, this could, could fail. So let me pause for a second. Is that any questions on this and how this is working? Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> right. And Great so question. Well, just try to keep this, keep this, keep this. Without going back to my first principles yep. and, and building security, just passing the test. Yeah. 
It's great. So just to, in case everyone didn't hear that, how do you keep the developer from basically determining the answer to the test by just continually tweaking it until they get it passed and not, they're, not, they're not really understanding what they did wrong or truly trying to fix it, right? Um, you know, that's obviously behavior we have to manage. Um, again, this is where I wanted to, to build this out and explain this a little bit better, but um, you can collect data on across all the developers. So there's this tool called Sonar Cube um, that you might be able to use that will collect data off all the tools and we'll know what developers are failing what tests and how many times they've been failing. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Um, that now becomes my job as the security person is to watch, you know, what's the failure rate on our developers? Like who, who do I need to go talk to and figure out what's going on? So now I can spend my time looking at the health of the system rather than going and running, you know, a, a, a scan and trying to get that feedback back to the developer and, and then negotiate with them. So I can now step back and look at the health of the system. The other thing I would say is that just like the developer, how they're innovating, we'll be innovating on the security team as well. So we're going to, in fact, the next step I was going to start to talk about is there's other tests through here that we can start to integrate. Like, um, so make this a little more interactive. Um, what types of issues have you guys seen in apps? If you've done testing, like if you've had someone test your apps or, um, or if you've done testing, what types of issues have you guys seen developers make mistakes on? Even in the infrastructure, not even in the source code. Any ideas? How about, how about uh, credentials? Has, has anyone ever seen a hard-coded credential or a credential in clear text, right? So if we start seeing things like that in our tests, we can start looking for them automatically as code's coming through. Um, and I'm not saying we'd be perfect at it, and again, the developer could try to f skirt their way around it, like, you know, hey, I'm gonna, um, you know, encode it just a little bit so they don't, they think it's encrypted, but it's not. Um, obviously, they could, if they spend their time doing that, we have a bigger problem. <laughs> um, but as we learn about mistakes they're making, we can work to automate tests to make sure that things like that aren't being introduced into the code as we go forward. And so that's the idea that now as a security team, we're going to start to innovate on how to make sure we're keeping their system under control. Is there a question down in front here? Or, okay. So there's, oh, go ahead. Yes, that's a great question. Um, so typically, it, it's a great question. The, the question was, as we work our tests in, how do we negotiate with the dev teams how much time we're allowed to take of their time? Because the time they're working on security issues, they're not actually creating product or features, right? Um, we handle that in a number of ways. The biggest way we handle that is we don't add tests in before we've kind of, um, we don't just throw a test in and it starts failing their build and they've got 100 things to fix now. Um, we, we, we do what we call, we, we onboard that test. So we, we kind of put it in a non-break mode where we just get the data and we're starting to respond to it, but it's not actually gonna stop the build process yet. And so what we'll do is we'll look for false positives and we'll, we'll basically tune that test to, to a, a point where, hey guys, you, had, you have to fix these things, but we're gonna let you tune the rest of this out. And so we, if you think about it, we're basically gonna onboard that test and tune it to the point where it's not so noisy that it's causing an issue. That's the way we handle that. Great, great question though. Um, so let me take this a step further. How, how many of you heard, have heard of infrastructure as code? It's a term that's floating around, right? So this same process can be used for infrastructure as, as code. So the way infrastructure as code means that rather than having like a VMware image that like we stand up and then we install our software on. Um, you can use, the best example that comes to my mind is something called cloud formation with Amazon Web Services. You can actually describe what a hosting infrastructure looks like, load balancer, routing, um, IP addressing, like literally like how do I want my data center to look? And you can put that all into a text file um, to basically describe what you want your environment to look like. So your infrastructure is now code. And you can spin up a new test environment just by saying, you know, spin me up one of these. <laughs> and 
and all that gets spun up, and then you can run your testing and things like that. So again, this, this is what's happening in the DevOps world under the covers. But what's nice about that is we can now also look at that code that's infrastructure and make sure they're not making mistakes. So again, you have passwords not being handled correctly. Um, you could have issues with the way they're setting up firewall rules. Um, there's a number of things you can think about from the infrastructure level that we can now test. There's a, there's a tool out there called CFN NAG on GitHub that's called CloudFormation NAG that will literally help you check for common problems that people make in CloudFormation templates, okay? So now we're, again, if we automate, if they're automating, we can automate, because now we can check their work. Um, and then, honestly, the next layer is that our stuff is running as code. So we can, anywhere in this process that we think we have a point we need to fit into and check something, because we've had a problem with it, we can now write code to either examine some source code or a cloud formation file. We can even do active testing. So when that new environment gets spun up from a cloud formation script, we could run things like Nessus um, or other tools to actively check the environment. Um, and that way, every time they spin that up, we're basically verifying, yes, it worked. A tool like Jenkins can also be used to schedule um, tests. So things like the open source vulnerability, we, it's not unusual to see companies scheduling that as well, because sometimes your code base can stay kind of uh, dormant and you don't touch it for a while. Well, we'll schedule the source code analysis, um, software composition analysis tool like NSP, or you also might have heard of Sneak or um, Black Duck, other tools like that. Um, basically, we'll schedule that to run like every week, just to make sure every week that we're looking at our code base to see were there any security vulnerabilities that were introduced. So you can see now the job that we used to have people doing manually, like we're trying to automate it everywhere we can, keeping our eyes on everything. Let me see if I missed any of my points here as I was talking through. I think, I think that was most of it. And I, I mentioned earlier that we, we now start to spend more of our time watching the process and, manage, and tweaking the process than we do um, running a scan or doing any particular tasks that we used to do manually. And that's really the value of this approach. Um, we can start to also collect metrics now we can start to see developer behaviors. Um, we can see where they need more training, and we can assign them more training. So we can now start to correct based on the data that we're collecting. Um, got gone through most of that. So I guess the question here is, can we, can we spell some success here? Um, you'll hear this term shift left. How can we? push the testing as far back in the development process as possible to get it closer to the developer so that we don't have 100 issues that we found during pen testing. Hopefully you don't find 100 during pen testing, but it's not unusual to find tens of issues. How can we make pen testing more of a verification exercise than a big bunch of work they have to go back to the drawing table and do? So how do we shift that work left in the process because it's gonna be cheaper and faster to fix? Um, can we automate? I mean, there really aren't too many situations I can think of that we, we can't automate. And actually, that was the point I was fishing for on the last slide. Unfortunately, you still can't automate everything. Um, what I've seen in my experience is working the best. You still have, I, I, I kind of made fun of it, but back in the plan phase, you still have some type of risk assessment step where you look at the scope of the change being made and um, you decide how much eyes that you need on that change. And so the most mature shops that I've seen, if it's a low risk change, they literally check off and say, I don't need to see it again. All the tooling will take care of it. I don't, I don't want to see it. But if they're going to change like the way they handle authentication in their system, then they have to go through and come back and do like manual reviews. And, and there's more work that ends up happening if it's a higher risk change. So I don't mean to say that we can eliminate all manual work. But what you can do is right size, like the type of change coming through, you can dictate how much um, manual assessment and where you want to look. But you can have that conversation up front with the developer. But if you have a real simple change, you just say, go, go for it, and it just flies right through to production. Um, 
I already mentioned this, but how can we iterate? So as we learn things, so as we're, as we're doing testing or finding flaws, maybe you have like bug crowd or something and someone's publicly told you about something, you can start to look at where in our process could we have caught this? And how can we improve and make sure this doesn't make it all the way out to production? So how can even security continue to iterate and get better? And the last thing, I didn't really hit on this either. If you're using all these tools the way I'm describing, um, it, it's going to freak regulators out. <laughs> but it's so incredible because it's now self-documenting. Um, there's not a whole lot. It's very, it's what I would consider brutally transparent. You know, if you have flaws, they're being recorded. The amount of times you had to go back and fix things are being recorded. Um, when you pass tests, all those test results are being recorded. You have to be careful how you're doing that to make sure that it would pass like a regulatory scrutiny if they're going to come in and you're going to use that as evidence. Um, I've even seen some cloud environments lately that are trying to surface um, their own data that are relevant to your environments. Um, so for instance, if an admin goes into your private area uh, that you have with a cloud provider, like you would actually be able to see that log event um, as, a, as their customer. And so if you start to automate these tools, you can start to become very transparent. And I think we'll move to a point in time where our regulators are actually more, um, not only are they excited to see that, but they start to expect that from, from companies. Because things are pretty painfully slow at times right now. And as we all know, when we have these paper records that get generated, um, usually the system has drifted off of that from the time if you actually have someone come in and audit. So it's, it, as we have the system self-documented, it actually becomes much more accurate. I have just a few minutes left. Any questions? I know that's a lot. I, I dove a lot there. Yeah, that's a good point. Again, I'm bouncing all over think tools. Um, um, I won't speak specifically to which tools we're using, but I'll give you examples. Um, so a lot of times what we're looking to do, um, we're pulling a lot of times from something called Docker Hub or other repositories. Um, and what we do is we use tools to scan those and make sure they're safe to use, both from a, they don't have security software issues as well as the configuration that those are coming with. So there's tools that can do that, like um, TwistLock. Um, there's a number of tools that can help you do that. And so we'll, we'll plug those into the process. We do some of our own manual scripts to check things as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's the idea. There are tools that can help you with that infrastructure piece. I, I mentioned CFN NAG is one that I've seen out there that will look at the, like for common mistakes in the actual cloud formation template. Yep, does that make sense? Yep. Any other questions? Yep. So I was just going to reference you to, to follow up with some questions. You can use your monitoring of the character to do the testing too. So yep. I mean, in addition to all the information security tools, you can set up monitoring of the character so that you can report those things or block you know, uh, or make services available. You know. So you can basically do monitoring of the character to monitor monitoring of the character to monitor your infrastructure. Yep. What's fun about this is, and what I've kind of been getting excited as we've been doing it is, it's no longer, a lot of times you get these silos of the tool teams, and my job right now has been to look across and figure out, if I'm trying to catch this in the process, where's the best place to catch it? And you're right, sometimes it's all the way back at things that we're looking for in the production environment. Maybe, sometimes it could even be log events getting generated that would tell me that someone made a mistake. Um, Cool. Well, I think I'm right at a little after 4.30 now, so I appreciate it. Um, if you guys want to chat at all, I'll hang out here for a few minutes. I had one little video here just to say, you know, if we, if we truly embrace this, I thought this was one of these cool things that I saw out there. We can actually make the hamster wheel work for us, right? So <laughs> thanks, everyone. I appreciate it.